four, three, two, one, zero. So my name is James Warren. Uh, you can call me Jay. My background personally is I've done a lot with like targeting micro architectures, a lot with hypervisors, a few like multi-factor authentication defeats, all of which more or less like my focus has always been early stage, like DARPA research, et cetera. Um, my friend and co-founder, Matt, um, he was a former operator and former IC member. Um, he and I are founding a conference called ResetCon. So RST, like you'd read on your silicon. Um, and it's our first iteration. So S September 13th through 15th is our first iteration this year. It's in Savannah, Georgia. So it's not next door, but it's pretty close. Um, I've been in security for over a decade and both Matt and I have been kind of underwhelmed by the general quality of talks at conferences outside of Usenix. Now, of course, there are edge cases. Um, some of my favorite talk, Chris Domus, you know, crazy talks like Sand Sifter and Mobfuscator. Um, but we thought we might be able to contribute to the security community at large by putting together a low cost technical conference focused entirely on research and novel exploitation um, that's close to an airport. Uh, so when I say low cost, talking like $200 a ticket, uh, not like, I mean, it is literally $200 a ticket for talks Friday through Sunday um at the DeSoto which is a, a pretty nifty hotel that we've got a group right at you are not required to stay at um it's all volunteer and since you're in the region um we will offer you guys like we will be offering you guys a group discount um just because we'd like you guys to attend and plus it seems like this group has a lot of the expertise whether at, at speaking or the the companies you guys work for it sounds like this is the perfect sweet spot so we'd love you guys to come a bit more about the conference. So our various work experiences um, kind of had us come to the shared conclusion that industries that support and run economies are really easy to pop. Um, and they need to be scrutinized and made aware of their woeful lack of preparedness, like from sophisticated adversaries, not necessarily just your normal hygiene. Um, we believe it's crucial for critical industries that drive economies like manufacturing, logistics. So your trains, planes, boats, automobiles, um, and utilities to comprehend and counteract advanced capabilities of nation state actors. And you can't know about those things unless you're caught up on the research and you're sat down going through the material. So targeting those industries has also just become a staple for international conflict, um, as Matt and I have seen, and as you guys have seen, as conflict escalates, generally so does the quality of tools deployed. Um, so. The research and exploitation our conferences our conference is focusing on pertains to these targets planes trains automobiles boats um, the sensors systems and architectures that they run on um, you know so maybe not like the whole vehicle maybe there's a subsystem or an architecture that's widely used all accepted all good so if you or someone you know uh, works for any of these companies like we're contacting and engaging as many as possible just to sort of get everybody in the room. Um, so feel free to help or just reach out to me um, or just attend or, or maybe your company wants to sponsor or maybe you want to speak, submit to our CFP. Who knows? Go for it. Um, we haven't officially released our CFP yet, but we already have a pretty solid lineup of speakers that you guys might recognize. Uh, Colin O'Flynn, um, Chip Whisperer, Chip Shouter, new AE guy, uh, done all kinds of cool stuff. Dan Petro, um, who's done a lot of, like he did uh, Eyeballer and um, a few fun, like less, I guess less professionally or academic focused um, pops for conferences. Daniel Genkin, who did the um, Spectre Meltdown stuff. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's a pretty big deal. He's nearby in Georgia Tech at the moment. So he's just gonna scoot on over. Um, Daniel Gruss is coming from Europe. Uh, he did a whole bunch of high resolution timers from user space, like side channel attacks from JavaScript, uh, focused a little bit on micro architectures, um, but also fo they're focused on like uh, power attacks and things like that. So attacking using uh, Rohammer or PT guard 
all kinds of things. So they have a pretty cool presentation they're bringing. And Russell Handorf, who was like a, a, a guy I worked with briefly at the Bureau, um, computer scientist, forensics guy, um, who's done all kinds of open source intelligence. And, you know, he's kind of been all over the place. So he's, he's going to be really fun to talk to as well. So, um, you know, if that sounds good, awesome. Thank you for your time. Uh, if again, I'll post some links, if you guys think you want to attend, uh, ticket prices are low. If you have questions for me personally, I'll post my email as well. Feel free to just email me. I'll answer. Um, and a direct link for tickets. Um, if we have time for, for questions, which we may or may not, uh, I'm happy to answer them. And if we don't, just again, email me. Don't be shy. I'm, I'm here. That is all. All right. Thanks, Jay. I, I guess the, yeah, Nixie says, sounds like a great time. Looks like you just answered the question before I asked it. I was going to ask for links. Uh, so thank you for posting those. When do you think your CFP is going to open? Our CFP is slated to drop uh, in June one currently, but technically you can submit now. It's it's you it's open, but we haven't announced it. We just got everything set up on OpenConf and all that stuff, and you know you you can submit now if you want. Um, but it's officially open uh, June one. That's when I start reviewing things and start right. advertising. Fantastic. Are there any other questions for Jay? Okay, Keller, Here. maybe you want to bring cars. I don't know. <laughs> uh okay well with that thanks jay for letting us know about this new conference coming up i'm really excited about it uh, again thank you for coming out tonight on short notice i know i kind of dragged my feet that i messaged you today i was like yes <laughs> let, let's do it i forgot i forgot to mention did i mention that we we're giving you guys a, a discount code for just being in the area and doing this thing? yes you, you okay did mention i will it. yeah uh we weren't sure which one we were making it for uh so we made it we made one for both groups I just kind of guessed and I made Space Coast Cyber, but I'm typing it. Um, and that that is the discount code. If you want it, it's yours. Have it. All right. Well, thank you so much for the discount code too. So hopefully we can drum up some more people to attend the conference or actually give a presentation, even submit this for the CFP. Uh, or maybe somebody knows, like you said, somebody who would like to sponsor this, this conference. Sounds like it's going to cover some great material. Um, especially around some of the, you mentioned some of the critical infrastructure areas, uh, which become very important, especially in times of conflict and whatnot, but even in no conflict, uh, as we've seen some some of the different infrastructures being broken into. Um, okay, well, thanks, Jay. If anybody ends up having any additional questions afterwards, Jay's information is there in text, and you can always use the chat while you're here too, uh, the chat with him directly. Thank I'll you be very much. Out. All right. Uh, John, I'm going to turn it over to you now, and I'm going to just take me a moment to make sure that you can share your screen. Yeah, you should be able to share your screen. All right. Can you all see it? Yep, I can see it. Yeah, first off, uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to you all. So if anybody's wondering, uh, obviously I haven't met any of you guys before, so um, a little bit about myself. I'm studying computer information systems uh, at the University of Louisville in Kentucky. I'm a senior about to graduate in um a few weeks which is crazy uh real life is rapidly impending um so yep i'm currently working at aptive they're a tier one automotive supplier uh providing signal and power solutions and advanced safety and user experience equipment to pretty much every manufacturer you can think of uh the detroit three are three of our four biggest customers um volkswagens are the biggest one but we sell to pretty much pretty much everybody um I have a blog, Auto Digest, where I just write about all sorts of things automotive related. I'll have a story coming out soon uh, when I write done with some assignments and whatnot. To it's it's with a, an automotive photographer that's done projects for like Ferrari and Rolls Royce and everything. He's out of Michigan. This dude named Andy Hedrick, really cool guy. Uh, but I write about technology, automotive technology, and and some cybersecurity on there also. Um, I was at Mercedes of Louisville. That was my first job in the uh, automotive industry. And then I was at the Center for Automotive Research in Ann Arbor uh, two summers ago, helping them as an events and marketing intern. And first and foremost, yeah, just, just a big gearhead. So uh, I told them beforehand, I'm interested in cybersecurity, but I wouldn't be doing it unless it was automotive. So I'm really glad to have found my way into the, uh, the niche of automotive cybersecurity early on in the career. And if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to, I don't, I don't care if you come off the, 
the mic and, and start talking or you can just drop it in the chat and I'll uh, do my best to keep an eye on that. So yeah, I'll be presenting on a lot of the current trends and uh, technologies that we're seeing in the in the industry. Um, upstream cybersecurity kind of releases the most comprehensive annual report that you'll see. I mean, they've been doing it for at least uh, probably at least five years. Um, and this is obviously the 2024 one. But if you're interested in reading that whole report, it's like 130 pages long. I have not read the whole thing. I've taken some of the highlights uh, and I won't be covering 130 pages worth of information. So you guys will be able to get out of here tonight. Um, but yeah, this is uh, credit to them for a lot of the, the data here. So just to start off, I um, always like to talk about like specifics. So um, there's a regulation, UNR 155. Uh, these cars have to have cybersecurity management systems, which is essentially covering like update lifecycle, update lifecycle management and whatnot. And uh, Porsche has been, they decided not to spend the money to retrofit some of their models with these cars in the European market, the European Union. Um, so they, they cannot sell the, the 718 and, and the Macan, like the Boxster, uh, they just can't sell it because it doesn't comply with the regulations, which they have to they have to have to be able to sell in that market. So we're already seeing like pretty substantial material impacts of these cybersecurity regulations that are coming into play uh, this year. Funny enough, the car that I included in the picture is <clears throat> the highest trim level of the 718. So they can actually still sell that because the volume is so low. It doesn't meet the critical threshold that the regulation requires to have to sell, but um, the cheaper versions of that uh, Porsches had to pull from production uh, or stop the sell in that area. So I've had to imagine uh, values on those cars have gone up recently. So yeah, the big picture, uh, it's the 2015 G-Packs, like what everybody talks about. I'm sure Ryan covered that as like kind of the, I mean, the automotive industry, automotive cybersecurity industry existed before that, but it really woke everybody up and because it, it literally threw a, a flaw um, an open port in the T-Mobile networking system. They were able to <clears throat> control like everything about a 2015 Jeep Grand Cherokee and Wired covered it and reported on it. it just kind of sits uh, Fiat Chrysler into a uh, panic um, and everybody else was like, okay, all right, we're, get, we're gonna start spending money on this. Um, so yeah, 50% of all the cyber incidents in 2023 had higher massive impact. And I'll put that in context later in the presentation. Remote attacks are like super <clears throat> trendy right now. Everything's connected. Um, you know, in-person stuff is still like a thing, but remote attacks are becoming a lot more prop, uh, popular. Deep and dark web, that's where a lot of these forums are where people share uh, code or, or techniques for how to steal cars. A lot of it right now is like stealing cars. We're, we haven't seen ransomware or like anything at scale like that. I mean, it's possible. It's kind of a nightmare scenario for a an OEM to face that, you know, if, if all the Toyotas connected to the Southeastern network hub uh, just won't start one morning because ransomware hit their call home server, but like it's technically possible. So um, yeah, trying to avoid that. Everything's getting more complicated. Uh, more and more parts are networked to other pieces in the car and then to other pieces of infrastructure outside of the car. So the attack surface is exponentially increasing. Um, and yeah, OEMs, I mean, I'd say overall, they're still largely in preventative spending mode, which is good because people haven't died yet because of a hack on a bunch of cars, but. Okay, yeah, I see. Yeah, they were in Michigan with the Jeep, did the Jeep thing. Yeah, my manager at my company worked at Jeep at the time and uh, the basically the fire alarms were going off in the office. Everybody was <laughs> going nuts. Um, and yeah, once again, if anybody has any questions, just. Uh, go ahead and ask. So this is just a screenshot from the upstream cybersecurity report, um, deep and dark web. A lot of the stuff is targeting, you know, applicable to a lot more than just one OEM. A lot of these OEMs share code and, and share parts, just like we sell a bunch of OEMs. So um, if somebody found a vulnerability in something that we made hypothetically then or another supplier, then uh, it would apply to more, uh, more than one OEM. Um, most likely. This is an interesting graph. Um, a lot of the people aren't super interested in personally identifiable information yet. I'm sure that'll become more of a threat as uh, the databases are able to be accessed and whatnot. But yeah, the vulnerability exploits through like APIs and whatnot is what uh, people are interested in because it can give you access to all sorts of data. Um, and then the, like all these cars have apps now. And if you can hack in through the app, then you can probably laterally move through the network in some respect and either gain access to a car or or even um, company data. I think Mercedes-Benz had a breach where 
somebody got into the app and then was able to get onto the uh, the corporate network to some degree because the connection was there. My voice is, I don't know if it's allergies or what, but I am struggling. So I apologize. I may have to mute my camera or something. Um, yeah. So end users, like insurance is a big thing right now. You know, the Kia, the whole Kia boys uh, thing and the Hyundais and whatnot is a big problem. Um, if you can't insure your car, then, I mean, technically, I guess you shouldn't be able to drive it. People still will, but uh, that's a big thing. Progressive State Farm have stopped writing policies. And then Land Rovers in the UK are just getting stolen left and right. Um, so that headline, uh, yeah, that sucked. Imagine getting a nice new car and then one day later it's it's gone. Um, Land Rovers should probably beef up their cybersecurity a bit. So yeah, we've seen this in, in, in my work, like, and it's not unique to us. These parts manufacturers, they're going to buy all sorts of parts from everybody else. It's really tedious and time consuming to analyze every bit of code that's in all those parts. A lot of it's going to be open source code that inevitably will have vulnerabilities. And a lot of times um, manufacturers will choose to accept the risk because they just, you know, cybersecurity is they don't want slowing down projects. They don't want to have to push the release, the release date back on a new model because of cybersecurity stuff, which makes sense. Uh, so not all the vulnerabilities are going to be patched. Uh, it's not financially feasible to do that, of course, even if they're known vulnerabilities. Um, yeah, you're going to have physical parts come from everywhere. You may have uh, an ECU that Bosch makes that's going to have the chip from NXP or, or uh, TSMC or something and, and software from another company, a different, you know, storage from another company. And it, it it's just, it's hard to track that um, even if you are an OEM, like, okay, so you have, if you have a database of the stuff in the car, how granular does it get? If you go one step down, you have the ECU, but does that have in the database all the different parts from the tier twos and threes that are incorporated into that um, that larger unit. Um, and then if you have the hardware database, that doesn't even include the software, which is a whole other layer of complexity. And then how do you merge those? I can be, that's that's um, a lot of the challenges that the companies are facing right now in the industry. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, a lot, sometimes the sometimes the stuff can be um, just with management or, you know, team changes, you know, if a team worked on a project and they had all the documentation and then the project lead, left probably you're good i mean but like not in all the cases it depends i mean they could have just saved it on their own computer um so yeah i can that can bring a lot of challenges and the lifespan i mean you have in what other area do you have to have cyber systems that have to function for 12 to 30 years at a high extremely low rate of failure it's a unique environment you're going to have at least one person driving the car for now. So that's a huge liability. And um, all these different parts need to communicate with each other for the lifetime of the vehicle. Um, and if one part, if you get a, an over-the-air update from the OEM and it, it updates uh, a few different ECUs and leaves out one, and then you have a secure boot mechanism that, you know, maybe the keys were changed or something, um, will it not talk to that ECU anymore? You have to take everything into account, make sure everything can still talk to each other. Um, digital tools. Or, oh, yep. I say, yeah, you don't, you don't want to over the air update suddenly bricking your car. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. You gotta, val the validation has to be like literally 100% effective. Um, yeah. And then digital twins, you know, there's some different companies that are working on that. Like you'll have all the, which is, again, goes back to the database part, but you'll have us like a website where you can go to that has a bunch of the main pieces of the car and the software and the hardware kind of all tracked and mapped to that exact VIN number. And you can kind of see, and it's right now it's for vehicle security operations centers and it helps with maintenance prediction technology too. So you can kind of estimate when um, when owner X of this car in Tennessee needs to bring their, their stuff in for an oil change or whatnot. And then you can track like this part has early failure or whatnot. So it's being used for, for maintenance, but also cybersecurity. Uh, Digital Twins obviously takes a ton of compute and storage and AI machine learning algorithms mapped on top of all this data. Cause I mean, you're going to have thousands, thousands upon thousands of cars, which will each have a huge database depending on the complexity of the digital twin of data associated with that VIN number. Um, and yeah, yeah. Back to the updating parts, you got to make sure that if you have like an IDPS sensor in the car, just because it runs great and plays nice with the other parts when it leaves the factory, doesn't mean that it will continue to do so for 15 years. And so then it's like, okay, how much was it economically feasible to do that in the first place? Um, was it really worth the development cost and the integration cost if, if they only work for five years? Um, and then if it doesn't work, does that just mean that the car doesn't start anymore? What does it just say, take it out, like remove the IDPS sensor or something? 
these are all questions that really have never been asked before and haven't had to be um, solved until recently. Hey, John, there's a quick question on chat. Uh, CW is wondering, are there excess thefts? There are question, excess thefts reported in Canada and New York City. Is this theft problematic anywhere else? Yeah, I don't I don't know exactly about the Canada and New York City. I, uh, I would assume it's like maybe Dodges or Kia or Hyundai. Um, but yeah, like I said, one of the earlier slides, Jaguar Land Rover apparently has a unique problem in the United Kingdom. I haven't, I did some research. I don't see that they have the same problem here in the States. I'm not sure why that would be, or if it does, it's just not getting covered as much as it was in the UK media. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, Kia and Hyundai, um, if you want to know, if you want to know what not to do for automotive cybersecurity, contact them, get what they did, and then just cross out everything and don't do that. Uh, it's a hardware method of entry, but it's at base, like, it could be mitigated with software, um, the, he and Kanda, the Hyundai and Kia stuff. Hopefully that answers your question, CW. I don't know exactly about the Canada and New York City issue. Um, yeah, the, the high massive scale attacks are getting a lot more popular. You have to think about all sorts of other stuff outside the car now because it's going to communicate with so much. EVs um, typically are built on an architecture that prioritizes software way more than internal combustion, which helps in a lot of ways, but increases their attack surface. Charging stations, you have to watch out for those. Uh, companion apps, you know, if you have a, where I used to work, work at Mercedes, you could unlock and lock the car, roll down the windows, start it remotely and all that sort of stuff. I mean, if somebody could hack into your car and start it remotely, and then I think they have a timeout where it'll cut off after like 20 minutes. But I think if you're able to mitigate that, just wait till someone's garage door is closed and then just start the car and leave it running like all night. Um, that's definitely a, a threat. Um, yeah, it's the trendy on the, the high and massive shale attacks. Huge difference between 2022 and 2023. Uh, massive, uh, big spike there. And then, yeah, social media is being used. Twitter and <clears throat> Telegram, surface web stuff is being used just as much as dark web to communicate between the bad guys. Yeah, so inevitable AI talk. Um, <laughs> defenders are using it, analyze tons of code, security operations centers on the enterprise side and then you know, limited adoption on vehicle security operations centers, which is basically where you have some level of real-time data feed from the vehicle back to uh, the OEM operation center that it can, they can monitor, you know, did this Tesla in Austin, Texas, did it malfunction? Why did it malfunction? Are there in, any indicators of compromise? Um, and everybody's very hush-hush about this and the uh, level of deployment. So, it's hard to find what OEMs even have vehicle security operations centers. And if they do, to what degree, my best guess is that Tesla does. Um, and I think um, some of the best OEMs do also, but yeah, AI is definitely being used on the attacker and defender side. And yeah, that's where we see massive spike in the scale of the incidents. And it's probably because you have charging stations and um, a bunch of cars that communicate to more centralized servers than they used to and everything's wanting to talk to each other. So that's cool, except uh, once you access one point, then you can access a lot of others. Yeah, low scale attacks has dropped dramatically and that's just because not necessarily because they're harder to do. It's probably not the case. It's just uh, there's lower hanging fruit available now. And why would I try to do a hardware glitch where I have to take a panel off of a car and plug into the headlight, adaptive headlight socket for a few hours when I could just enter uh, enter through an API vulnerability. So yeah, I was I was curious about the whole IDP in-vehicle IDPS thing. Um, I posted on LinkedIn about it, just like, hey, network, uh, who knows about this sort of stuff? And inevitably everybody was like super hush hush, but it's my best guess that Tesla is utilizing these in their models. Um, it could be limited to the S and X. I don't, I don't know. Um, but I'm like 95% sure that they have some sort of detection system that's actively running on their cars. They can communicate back to a, a centralized server. Um, and then, yeah, the trucking and commercial vehicle fleets are utilizing it a lot more right now than consumer grade vehicles. Um, Ford may be using it on, if I had to guess, if they were using it, it would probably be on the Lightning and the Mach-E. But that's just really interesting to me. I wish there was a a spreadsheet that had exactly what level was being used where, but that when pigs fly, you have a lot of players in this uh, new category, fleet defender, Argus, ETOS, which is owned by uh, Bosch, Vic one offer products. So if, if it's still in its infancy, it's, it's rapidly becoming more mature. And there are a lot of players trying to grow that market and sell those types of products. Um, but 
you you'll have a lot of false positives and false negatives um and like if you're an analyst i mean you got like if you had idps's on thousands and thousands of cars how many analysts would you need to sort through all the uh the false positives and negatives it's just really prohibitive and the technology is not quite good enough yet that's where tesla most likely benefits because they develop way more of the software and the hardware in-house vertically integrated as opposed to the other OEMs. So they know exactly how things should be running all the time. So they can code their monitoring systems a lot easier than a General Motors would be able to. Um, and yeah, through the through the post on LinkedIn, it seems uh, one person was saying that a lot of the solutions on the market um, look for tri- like look for variations in the, uh, the overall trends on the network. They don't really have uh, specific indicators of compromise saved to the system that it will flag on a one-to-one, I guess, uh, match. So that's interesting. I don't know if that's a limitation with the hardware compute in terms of like, maybe that's just not feasible. Um, but yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, and then, yeah, software updates. Like I said, if you if you have an IDPS in the vehicle when it ships, that doesn't mean that once the software inevitably gets changed multiple times by the OEM, let alone if a tuner is changing it themselves with a, a um, ECU update or flash, you know, how do you treat that? Uh, and then, yeah. How do you treat that? You just deactivate the system because if somebody flashed their ECU, if your IDPS is actively monitoring that it would probably be sending, depends on how often the alert interval is, but it could be sending tens or hundreds of alerts back to the VSOC a day that like, hey, this car's broken. Hey, this car's broken. Hey, this car's broken. Like it would just be really annoying. So uh, that's the problems with this stuff so far. This is a trend, I guess, not specifically with um, cybersecurity, but I was talking with a gal who works at uh, Mercedes-Benz North America and um, in their smart mobility unit. And this is really cool. They have like, they use the suspension data from the cars and they'll aggregate that and send it to the um, local authority, local municipality. It was, it, the trial run was in Boston. This was, you can look up the press release. Um, this was like a year ago when it started. I don't know if it's been rolled out on larger scale yet to other municipalities or the success of the, of the program. Uh, it'd be interesting to see, but I mean, it's just really cool to see how the, the connected cars being used to, I guess, enhance public safety. And then I was, I put there at the bottom, like, I mean, if people keep having, you know, if if 10 Mercedes have an accident at the same exact location, this intersection, <clears throat> maybe it'd be worthwhile telling the city that and having somebody go out there and kind of look at the design of that intersection, or maybe there's an obstruction or something that they can work on. Uh, yeah, yeah, I thought that was, I thought that was super cool. The automatic reporting of potholes. And I'm sure Boston's a great place to do that. Is it's probably like driving in a third world country. Yeah, Michigan's the same way. <laughs> yeah. For those of you who have ever been to Michigan, it's pothole haven there. Yeah, yeah. They, should, so, they should roll it out in Detroit next. Yeah, it got so bad that actually the state of Michigan was actually marking roads that it would no longer maintain and it was going to take them back to dirt and, and oh, not God. repave them. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I don't know if other I don't know if other OEMs are doing this. Um Mercedes is typically a pretty pioneering company. So yeah, it'd be I'd be an interesting thing to follow up on. Yeah, I'm getting to the end of the presentation. Um, 2024, looking forward, you know, the software-defined vehicle obviously is rapidly increasing the attack surfaces thanks to charging networks, uh, mobile apps, all sorts of other things that are talking to each other. Uh, Cities have a lot of times, you know, their grid will be connected, stoplights and and traffic lights and whatnot to monitor traffic and stuff. and, And, you know, attackers may be able to go in through that route. And I guess hypothetically, maybe change everything in the city to a red light for an hour. There are no green lights, which would be catastrophic. Um, yeah, gener- generative AI, of course. And then, yeah, UN, UNR 155 and 156 and SA, uh, SA21434 are the big cybersecurity regulations that the industry is trying to uh, adapt to right now. And yeah, it's definitely having material impacts. You know, Porsche literally can't sell two models that were presumably pretty profitable just because of uh, 155. So, um, but a lot of companies are getting certified on on these different regulations. And it, it's it's good. Like, it, number one, it keeps people safe and it gives people a lot of jobs because it makes more work to do. But um, yeah, that's definitely a challenge for suppliers. And, you know, if you have a smaller supplier, not as big of a budget, like a tier three, if you have to be compliant with these regulations, maybe that's a... a it could be a huge deal to your small company. Um, and here's here's all my information. If anybody would like to to reach out, I'm always open to chatting about anything automotive cybersecurity related or or even cybersecurity. So, yeah. And then I, I have the blog where I, I cover all sorts of uh, car stuff that I find interesting. Thank you guys. All right, great talk, John. Thanks for coming out tonight and 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 
you know, letting us know about all these <laughs> different things and things to expect in the future and, and whatnot. A lot of, a lot of interesting concepts there and stuff that's going on, like the Porsches not being sold because of not meeting cybersecurity requirements. I'm not sure how far that would get here in the U S considering the, you know, so much is profit driven, market driven. Um, do you, do you foresee something like that happening in the U S where the feds would actually say you can't sell this because it, it's not meeting cybersecurity requirements for automotive industry. Yeah. I mean, two, one, four, three, four is a requirement. Um, you have a bunch of companies that are like specializing in issuing those certifications. Um, and yeah, I think the Biden administration released like general cybersecurity regulations, but they can be interpreted to apply to automotive companies. So yeah, I mean, I, I could see it for sure. I think that it'll be interesting once someone ends up does having that, like, uh, I don't know what you would call it, maybe the, like the breakwater moment or something, but like where the, the big hack does take place and a bunch of people are financially impacted. And then the lawsuits, the lawsuits will just be insane. And they'll inevitably go after the OEM, the the manufacturer, um, General Motors or whoever, but, but then General Motors will inevitably turn around and sue every supplier that touched that part they identified as responsible. So the dominoes will fall. And uh, yeah, I don't, I can see it happening. Um, who knows? I say like fin a big financial impact or a big um, uh, consumer harm, right? Yeah. Uh, bigger than the 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 top. What is it? The 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 airbag issue that's been happening for a while. Takata. Now. Not cyber. Yeah, yeah. Takata. Yeah. I was gonna say Tata, but that's a different company. Um, <laughs> no, you got it. <laughs> But the, uh, you know, that was a financial impact, but not a cybersecurity impact. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, I'm wondering like what, what that moment will be that will change the public's mind, that will change the regulator's mind to say, this is, this is important. I mean, I remember seeing conversations, uh, I think all the way back to when we were in Michigan with the big three and seeing cybersecurity folks publishing where they had those talks with the boardrooms and it was those kind of similar things that we've heard before from other industries is like, why would anybody want to attack a car? Why mm -hmm. would anybody want to hack a car? And now here we are today. And, yeah. and there are cybersecurity incidents um, occurring. There was the, the Audi Bluetooth one for, I think Jay, if you're still here there, at one point, there was the proof of concept to show that there was a, a Bluetooth hack on specific Audis. Of course you had to be close enough. Um, and I do think oh, the Jeep one, I do think the Jeep one was set up to demonstrate it. It wasn't an actual, um, well, it was actual in the sense that they did it, but as far as like a, uh, production vehicle that that exploit didn't exist in the wild, but it was a proof of concept. Um, still an eye opener to hear about it. It was all over the news that day. Um, who would hack a car us? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm reading the chat. Um, yeah. So yeah, you, know, you you mentioned Biden. Of course, that administration, uh, depending on what happens with with voting later uh, this year, may or may not continue, right? And we'll see a change again, uh, because some of the stuff that's been uh, spoken about has been done through or requirements made, right? Have been, have been done through executive orders, not necessarily made into uh, regulations in the CFR or anything like that. So you know, there's always a possibility you get a new administration in and they just override the existing executive order. Mm -hmm. Um, so with that, knowing the executive orders, you know, Biden's administration said that, you know, things like the 16 critical infrastructure sectors, which includes automotive, uh, must do these things, right? One of them software build materials. And I know you mentioned build materials kind of in passing earlier on, but what's your thought on doing software build materials for, um, automotive and its complexities? It's really hard because you have, um, different teams from a bunch of different companies working with all sorts of different, either bespoke code, open source code, and you, you can, you can use like scanners to, to parse through that code using AI and, and whatnot to look for, auto, um, to flag stuff automatically, but the effectiveness is not going to be hundred percent hiring an analyst to comb through. I mean, the average car has like way more lines of code than, um, a fighter jet. Cause it's just like so many parts and all those parts have like a lot of code and they're all talking to each other. I want to say like 50 million lines. I don't know if that's the number. Somebody can look it up and fact check me, but like it's a, it's way more code than like anything else you can buy. Um, so yeah, it's really, really hard to do to even, it would be nice if you even had a hundred percent efficacy on just having all the bits of code tracked in a centralized database. If you're a, a, a tier one or a, a you know, a manufacturer 
an OEM. Um, but yeah, then then the ability to sift through that with a tool that is effective enough um, and doesn't create more work than it saves almost um, with false positives and negatives is is really hard to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, coming from a medical device space, we, we're seeing something similar to you. Not only long-lived products uh, in the industry, uh, you think of like capital equipment, especially like MRIs and stuff like that, um, but also the complexities of producing software-based materials too, especially when there's uh, multiple uh, manufacturing folks involved if you're pulling pieces from different outfits. I know it's not as crazy as the automotive industry, um, but you know it, it definitely has its complexities too. So in today's cars, you know, think of the modern car, you were mentioning like 50 million lines of code, you know, more or less, um, but also the sense that, what is it, on average, your modern car has what, like 100 processors in it or something like yeah. that. It's a yeah. lot compared to what it was just even only five, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and each one of those could be running a bit of code too. And, and it's crazy to think about like, if I roll down my window, it has to call something on a processor in the door to do it. Yeah. I, it's not just a, a crank or just a button anymore. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's just a lot that, to, to do. So I'm wondering if the automotive, like keeping on, on that lot, that track of thought right now mm -hmm. is for automotive, uh, what are they, have you in your experience so far, are you aware if they're even auditing their tier one through tier three suppliers um, that have active pieces? So think anything with sulfur on it. Uh, to see that they must be a certain level of cybersecurity um, policies, procedures, like reviews, like all that kind of stuff, be able to turn over their S-bombs to the manufacturer that have that whole chain of custody kind of thing going on. Like, is any of that being done right now? Have you seen it or are you aware of it? Yeah, it is. Uh, UNR 155, 156 and 21434 do a lot to address that. And you have to get certified and, and have like a bunch of um, a ton of processes in place. But yeah, the granularity on it is kind of infinite. You know, just because a supplier passed a certification test two years ago, does that mean that new management hasn't come in and cut some costs and cut some corners? Um, so just because you had it in a point of time doesn't mean that it's in perpetuity. Uh, good cybersecurity practices and development, uh, secure code development at the company. But yeah, they definitely are um, the hundred percent companies are uh, it depend. It's not, it's not universal, but the, you know, there, there are companies that are going down their supply chain and, and trying to make sure that their their customers and their suppliers have um, the best interest of the end user in mind in terms of developing safe components. Okay. I was going to just real quick, another caveat, like uh, Tesla has the Cybertruck and it, it doesn't, it has steer by wire completely and it uses automotive ethernet. Automotive ethernet's being used a lot more um, because the data throughput is a lot better than the traditional network architectures like CAN or CAN XL or CAN FD. Um, but like that introduces vulnerabilities because, uh, hackers are going to know how to mess with ethernet type stuff way better than can, which is a bespoke protocol developed by Bosch that I think was released in like 83 or something. Um, so yeah, and it, it saves wiring. They, they literally have to use it for the steer by wire in the cyber truck. Like automotive ethernet was has to be used because can it's a it's very um like the error rate on it is really low but the throughput is just not there for steering at 80 miles an hour it's just not and it saves wiring like the the cyber truck has a ton less weight like something like 100 pounds less than if they through the use of automotive ethernet and the network topology of like ecus around the car as opposed to just individual wires going everywhere um so yeah the manufacturers are trying to cut weight to increase range and save money, but that that in and of itself also introduces other vulnerabilities in ways that you might not expect. Megan, I didn't know you, did you have a question you came on the- I did, yeah. Um, As a consumer right on the other end, you know, Tesla owner here, um, <laughs> is there anything we can do on our side to like prevent issues with hacking or otherwise? Um, I mean, the obvious, right? Don't connect your car to like a random Wi-Fi, but yeah, um, yeah. any other tips? I mean, not, it's, it's, I wish I had a, a magic thing, but I mean, your, your ability, especially in the car space is as a consumer is like super limited. I mean, you, I would say just personal, the normal cyber hygiene stuff. So if somebody um, gets access to your home network or whatever, it's, it's a bit harder, but yeah, I mean, who's going to, it's hard. It, it's super hard to tell the average consumer, like, okay, only turn on your connect your car to your home Wi-Fi 
once a month, let it check for updates and then disconnect it. Number one, they're not going to know how to, they're probably like older than us and may not even know how to do that. And then they're not going to want to do that month by month. So yeah, it's, it's pretty limited. Don't buy a Kia or Hyundai. Teslas are, Teslas are the best, uh, knock on wood with automotive cybersecurity because they have, they actually have bug bounty programs and actively pay out huge sums of money for people who find vulnerabilities. Because of that, they are a larger target, but they definitely are more disciplined than the other OEMs. Yeah, I saw the you know, recent article about the Tesla being stolen at the charging stations because the Tesla owners get free Wi-Fi from the charging stations. Mm -hmm. And somebody just run ran up an evil AP right at the charging station. The owner logged into it using the same credentials that they created their Tesla account with. And the mm -hmm. attacker was able then to duplicate their key and then steal the car, the digital key. Oh wow! I didn't even I didn't even see that. Yeah. Well, I guess that ties back to the uh, I guess credentials like on their mobile app or something. That's what you said, right? Maybe don't share passwords. Yeah, don't reuse. Right? Yeah. Don't reuse the same passwords. Don't, you know, it's typical cyber hygiene, and you know, it was just same credentials. So the person once they sniffed the traffic, were able to use those credentials then to mm -hmm. log into the site, and once they get log on the site, there was no MFA on the account mm -hmm. or something. They were able to bypass it, something. Okay. And I'll have to find the article for you. Um, yeah. Then they were able to duplicate the key because Tesla has the digital key and there's no protections. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't specify a device. It's not secured to one specific device or anything like that. So they're able to say, I need to, you know, either it was a lost key or I need to duplicate my key to this device. And it did. And then the the person was able to then steal the car. There's no MFA on the on the account, your actual Tesla account at all. So okay, there you go. <laughs> wow, uh, they definitely have a, a a lot bigger target on their back. I think anybody who's interested in automotive security research, Tesla is the gold standard. I had a quick question. Yes, sir. So uh, what is is there? I'm pretty new to cybersecurity in general. Um, I mean, just the last few years, I've started getting interested in and trying to. Uh, develop my own knowledge and skills to uh, to break into the, <laughs> into the profession. But um, I was five years in the army as a mechanic. Is there any, if, if say I, I started getting uh, opportunities to maybe um, learn more, do more with uh, car cyber, automobile cybersecurity, yeah. do you think is there any overlap to being a mechanic and understanding the inner works of the car or is, is everything digitally so different? You know, that that, it's really interesting you ask that. I actually, I don't have much experience. I mean, I started working at Aptiv, um January of last year. And, um, but before, before that, I, I, I've done the mechanic stuff too. I think it definitely helps. I mean, it won't help like a ton, but like it helps to know generally how, how cars work. I would say um, the thing that will apply the most is just kind of learning the different, how car um, network architectures are starting to work. You know, just like you have fuel lines that take fuel from the gas tank to the engine and, and, and coolant just from different parts, like data flows in a similar manner. You have to have the different, it has to talk to each other. So yeah, I, it's definitely doesn't hurt. And I would say, I would say it helps for sure. Kind of get your base knowledge off the ground. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for the question. And, and Megan, thank you for, for years. I, I do appreciate it. Yeah. The, <clears throat> one of the advantages of actually knowing the subsystems in a car is that when you're looking at uh, from, if you don't have any background in that, and you're looking at something that says, uh, yeah, the map sensor is saying this. And it's like, okay, but what exactly does that mean? And how significant is that? That's mm -hmm. where having that background in automotive really helps. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You can kind of put some context to the normal operation of things more. Um, but I, I'm, I'm on the, that, that would be, I would say that sort of knowledge would be super applicable if you're like actually doing um, security, like research and pen testing on cars and, and trying to see kind of what works on specific parts and what doesn't. But uh, at least for me, you know, I'm on the corporate side and, you know, I've, I've never, for the purposes of work, never touched a, uh, a car physically, like with an iPad in my hand or, or with a Linux machine trying to, to mess with it. So great. Are there any other questions? Oh, there you yeah, go. X-ray. Yeah. Going back to when you were talking about um, the laws that, they're trying to put in place mm -hmm. and people asking well, why would someone want to hack a car mm -hmm. there's actually a really good article um i'll post it in the chat called folk models of security and what it boils down to is 
and people operate on rules of thumb and it's their rule of thumb is pretty much dependent on their view of the situation. So most people, for instance, think of um, security, cybersecurity uh, online working much the same way as a burglar walking down the street and that they're walking past my house and they look at it and go, what a dump. And they look across the street and go, oh, I'm at mansion and I see five TVs through the windows. Let's rob them. And that's the way they think of somebody online. That I don't have a significant computer. Uh, I just have a Yahoo email address. That's of no use whatsoever. Um, I don't. I have a Facebook account and a um, Twitter and a host of other social media accounts. And they don't think it has any value because they don't know how the offender views that target and what they value in it. And that's mm -hmm. really what you have to defend against, not what you think is valuable, but yeah. what the the attacker thinks is valuable. Mm -hmm. And that's where that folk model of security that everybody has of limits them. And that's because they just don't have the imagination to understand what could possibly be done. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I started out in the military doing intelligence work on submarines and we did offensive work. And the whole idea is finding any and any possible way to get your info. And when I look at a car, a car is a leaking sieve of information. Mm -hmm. And the uh, recently, there was the issue where they wanted outlaw flippers in Canada because someone uh, demonstrated that they could do that Wi-Fi man-in-the-middle attack for a Tesla. And they said, yeah, we are going to ban the flipper. And my reaction was, well, wait a minute, if I'm an owner of a Tesla and they told me my, the car is secure, and it turns out that somebody with an off-the-shelf device, a regular laptop for that matter, could hack my car and steal it, rather than ban the laptop, uh, hey, legislator, why don't you go after Tesla for fraud for selling me a device they said was secure that's not? And we don't see that happening. And unfortunately, the life, the life cycle of policies and procedures typically takes about two generations or 40 years. So by the time we come up with the technology, it takes 40 years to really understand what the impact of that technology is and how we should make policies and procedures to implement it properly or protect us from it or whatever. Unfortunately, at the speed of the internet, uh, we may kill ourselves before we ever get the opportunity to yeah. figure this out. So leaves us with a conundrum, uh, especially now that automotive manufacturers are sharing the data they collect. They want to sell that data because they want another all the revenue stream. Insurance company says, I'll buy that from you. And so you may have a, a perfect driving record for 40 years, never an accident, never a ticket. And one day they send you a letter saying, we're raising your insurance rate because you tend to accelerate a little hard. So those are the issues that are that are facing us. And we're essentially defenseless. And uh, that's really starting to annoy people. Uh, when they be, more, pe more often than not, you know, we understand this problem. The people who don't understand this problem, like my mom, who's in her 90s, when she runs into this problem, she gets really bent out of shape. And we're going to see more and more and more of that. So I, I what somebody said earlier about lawsuits may be on the way yeah i fully expect that to happen yeah yeah i was gonna um uh thank you x-ray i was i was gonna add i, I was at the uh auto ISAC conference in dearborn and there were government officials there from the department of homeland security because they were extremely concerned about cars being used as biological weapons whether it's like like i said hacking at scale while people are going down the road maybe all the accelerators pedals are floored um or or if you if you just have like an autonomous vehicle that uh, you know if you were able to commandeer a tesla nobody in it and then put a bomb in there and like drive it into a stadium like that's what you know the government's definitely concerned about that oh and then i, I did have a thought on uh, what you can do to pr protect yourself um clear all your data from your car if you're trading it in to a dealership it most likely has that functionality look up how to do it and and do that. that that helps a lot because you can somebody else buys it they can see your phone call and if they if they're good enough i mean if they really wanted to maybe they could learn a lot about you um but definitely bluetooth pairing information you know if you had your home address plugged in i know mercedes because i work there you could plug in your home and work address to the navigation system so that you could just say hey mercedes take me home and then so if somebody didn't clear that then the next buyer would have someone's home address um so yeah yeah they yeah. can get your contacts all your contacts they can get a history of if you're, if you're a navigation system a history of all the addresses you've ever been to <laughs> all yeah. kinds of really fun stuff that you really probably don't want them having in yeah. some yeah. cases the information that the car has allows them to also access the account that your phone was using mm -hmm. so that's that's another back door that people hadn't seen coming yeah yeah jay made the comment before i did in text 
that you know when we rent a car the first thing we do is you know look in the the infotainment center and see what's in there that and inevitably somebody paired their phone with the car while they had it and they didn't bother to reset or erase the data maybe they don't even know how um, sometimes it's not that easy it's not evident uh, to the person yeah right now overall i'd say the industry is still in like a overall i'd say it's still like a preventative spending which is good i mean they've learned from other industries to it's better to spend the money up front to save yourself in the long run but yeah the sky the ceiling is like extremely high in terms of liability since you know you could have five people in one car and then if it gets in a wreck with another car that could be even more so yeah sadly some of the tools that the automotive manufacturers have put in place to quote, erase your data, uh, mm -hmm. don't work very well. Um, yeah. Kind of like uh, the hard drives that said, yeah, we have a built-in erase function. And it turns out the erase function doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't erase anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that can be a significant problem. Yeah, yeah. I just, the th thought everybody likes to steal catalytic converters because they can sell them. If the uh, the little, <laughs> little storage box that has all the car data, if it's like near the edge, maybe somebody would want to steal it. Oh, yeah, what's the, what's the next social media fad? Yeah, for real. Who knows? We have to wait till the TikTok boys get <laughs> get cracking again. Yeah, yeah. The uh, sensors themselves are wireless. Um, there has been proof that, like, if you have a car with adaptive headlights, control and move as you turn the wheel. If you take the headlight out, you can just plug right into that port and gain network access and send messages to wherever you want on the car including starting it or something. Yeah, you're absolutely correct, Justin. Unfortunately, people do prefer convenience over security until it impacts them, right? The uh, interesting thing I, I see, Jay, you know, talk about sensors. I was thinking about the contest this past year that was supposed to happen at DEF CON, though I didn't see what the results were of the TPMS range competition. So you remember they used to do the Wi-Fi competition, range competition, then they did the Bluetooth, RFID competitions for range. Uh, this past year, it was floated. I don't know X-Ray or anybody else that was there if you saw the results, if they actually did it, but there was a, a call for doing a competition for the TPMS um, range. The, you know, it's the, was that tire pressure monitoring system? So the, mm -hmm. the sensors. And uh, I saw Jay there mentioning, enjoy your permanently flat tires because uh, you could spoof that signal and make it seem like your, your tires are too low, too overpressure, you know, and then, you know, that usually results in some type of uh, dash indicator, right? That something's going on. Yeah, that's where the... I think it was Jonathan that mentioned that, but 100%, that's where some background knowledge helps. If you're trying to do research, you can think of like, okay, what are some sensors that I can get to? And if you didn't work on cars, you're probably not going to know what a TPMS does. Yeah, and those are wireless, so you don't even have to connect anything. Range is, uh, with the right antenna, range is a function of line of sight. So Yeah, yeah. And then the um, on sensors, like Tesla has, on their newer models, gone like all vision-based for the driving assistance. And this could happen for radar, LIDAR, or vision-based uh, camera systems. But like, um, I mean, you could spoof, you could make it think that there's something, there is research being done where you can make the car think that something's like immediately in front of it. And if you were going on the road and thought something was immediately in front of it and made it slam on the brakes, I mean, that is just like so dangerous. So um, it hasn't been done like in the wild yet, but uh, yeah, it's it's possible. I don't, I don't, um, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, can you track the car with those sensors? I'm not sure. Well, um, I mean, they have the ability to locate where their cars are. Like a, a, if it's a pretty smart car, like a Tesla or something, um, or a Mercedes, I know, I know you can, I know they know, because if you're on the app, you can see where your car is. Yeah. I say the rolling hotspots. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just trying to think of the TPMS actually has a unique serial number or UID or something like that, that it transmits as well when it's sending but i don't know you can um you can generally find something for instance uh, even an ethernet card if you don't have a mac address or an ip address the timing of the electrical signals coming off an ethernet card are very subtly different between each car so you can actually fingerprint an ethernet card based on the slight variations in timing of the electrical signals the difficulty is under what circumstances can you do that? So for instance, let's say I fingerprint a TPS, your front left tire TPMS. Um, that's great, but I have to be within range. Now, granted, if I have a parabolic dish and I've got some altitude, I could probably track you for many miles. Once you go in a parking deck or something like that, I might lose you. That's not really very efficient. You'd really need some kind of mesh or network of sensors over an area in order to do that consistently. 
Now, the way that auto manufacturers can track stuff like that is because they have an uplink via either cell phone or some other uh, wireless technology. Uh, uplink to some type of service that does have widespread connectivity, typically cell phone. So that's the only way they manage to do that. So without that, um, you actually have to be within line of sight distance of the vehicle in order to do it at all times. So yes, it can be tracked. Is it reasonable? Eh, I would, I would much, I would worry a lot more about that up, uplink signal being hacked. That's even, that's a much greater possibility because that all goes to a choke point on the actual internet. And so mm -hmm. that's, that's more of a uh, place where I would focus an attack if I were doing it. Yeah, I know that um, they uh, at the Auto Asset Conference last year, there was a company that had a two or three hundred thousand dollar rig. A number could be fake, but I'm pretty sure it was at least like multiple hundreds of thousands because I just could not believe it was that expensive. Um, but it functioned as it, it made the car think it was the cell tower. And so when it's searching for the strongest signal for a cell tower connection, it connected to this piece of equipment that they were rolling around on the server rack, and then they could see all the data coming to and from the car. Yeah, that's a cell site simulator. You can actually uh, build one. I forget the last amount I saw for dollars, but it was thousands. It wasn't all that expensive. Oh, okay. It was a cell site simulator. Um, Maybe they were it depends machine. on the complexity and what features you're trying to simulate, though. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, the, the, the company that was doing that was Block Harbor Cybersecurity. I know a few of their people. They're pretty good. The dollar amount could be fake news. Yeah, yeah, trucking fleet. I mean, even, I mean, it's not... I'm, I don't know the train. I don't know how connected trains are, but which is not the scope of today's conversation. But yeah, I mean, if you were able to cripple the train network, that'd be horrible too. Or trucking. There was uh, in the last year or so, somebody at DC four hundred four gave a talk on train security, and it was rather appalling. Yeah, yeah. Oh, agriculture too. Like John Deere, they're a member of Auto Asac. Uh, John Deere is definitely concerned with making sure that people can make food. Well, they're also concerned with stopping farmers from being able to fix their own equipment too. So there's that. Yeah, and yeah. Doom seeing Doom run on a tractor's uh, ECU is a great thing, right? And we saw that at DEF CON last year. Well, that's the that's the convenience trade off that people talk about. Like, sure, it'd be nice to be able to fix the computers, but I mean, I guess inevitably, if you make code more accessible, then it would be a bit easier for someone to do research. But yeah, to, I'm 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 pro uh, cheaper repair costs, but I guess that's what the company's thinking. Aside from more profits. <laughs> You can see the riding on the pavement Young kids that growing up in basements Online a whole new generation I'ma make mine so you better go take it Always they need a new replacement Decentralized can't contain it We're changing lives, yeah upgrading Call it suicide of the older generation Put the key to a banaya Make all the demons quiet yeah. We were built to thrive, yeah I think that we've all had enough What keeps you up at night, yeah Make all the demons quiet, yeah We were built to thrive, yeah